we all need outside friction. Even though we hate it, we need it. You know, you need an enemy. You need an arch nemesis. You need something that's pushing you, that's driving you. I did my most growth when I was at a decent amount of self-esteem mixed with an a-hole of a boss. And I started to push back because I had that friction. I was like, no, no. And I wanted to do better and do better. And if you take that away and there is no friction, it's really hard to be self-motivated. Not saying you can't do it, but man, it makes a difference. Yeah. And I always say, don't belittle your success or your goal. I say this all the time, whether it's writing or just life, you know, there's all these gurus out there like, I made a billion dollars. You can too. If you're living on the street, going from the street to an apartment is a gigantic success. And because you're not making a billion dollars, it's stupid to belittle yourself or your goal for just getting off the street. Or now that you're off the street, you just want to make a little bit more money and set your kids up with a better school. Those are amazing goals. This is Get Unstuck Podcast, a podcast for entrepreneurs who prioritize their life first, business second. I'm Mutita Panmuk, your host, who dedicates my life to designing and building a business that supports lifestyle. We will learn together from entrepreneurs around the world how they overcome their life challenges, their business of the code, and yet still get unstuck from the hamster wheel of burying themselves into their business. Because time is the number one commodity in the world that you cannot get back once it's gone. So let's shorten the learning curve and see how can we prioritize better. Let's get unstuck. Hi, Get Unstuck Nation. Our guest today, he has built over $10 million a year with 11 locations of restaurant franchise, as well as publishing company, editing platform, and also being an award-winning author. So without further ado, please welcome Charles D. Amico to get Unstuck Podcast today. Hi, Charles. Hello, everybody. How's your day going? So how your day is going? I know it's still early your time. <laughs> oh, early? I started about 4.30, seven days a week. So. Oh, man. <laughs> Rare, rarely does my body let me sleep in. I usually wake up around 4, 4.30. I'll look at the clock and be like, please don't be four. Please don't be four. And then I'm like, it's four. It's time. Like, I, I can't fall back asleep. <laughs> well, at least your biological clock gives you the time that wake up the same time every day. So that is actually good in a way, though. Yeah. I seem so good at sleeping, too. Like, I was really good for a long time. <laughs> Entrepreneur life hashtag. <laughs> right? They always say you'll work 80 hours for yourself because you don't want to work 40 for somebody else. Well, that's another thing, but you have unlimited money to access. So that is kind of like what you're going to choose, right? Right. So since you mentioned that, how you started this entrepreneurial journey though? So the short, like uh, abridged version is I was born and raised in Metro Detroit in the auto industry. And I was working in restaurants after college, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. The original plan was to go in the military because uh, of my background of psychology and criminology oh. and become maybe do sniper, NSA. I wanted to like work my way to the FBI. That was the original plan. And I hurt my leg uh, playing basketball. And the rehab took so long that when I finally made it to the military uh, in processing, all my paperwork was wrong. It was a mess. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to step back and go back to something I know is simple and work in restaurants. That's how I paid for college. While I was working for a Jimmy John's franchise, the auto industry collapsed in Detroit. And I remember watching like stores that were super busy, lose a lot of sales because they were used to dealing with all those vendors that just didn't exist anymore. And then I kind of watched the city reinvent itself. But you also watch people who work their whole lives lose everything and they didn't do anything wrong, right? Like they just trusted their employer. And I had always been that person who posted to a B and like would put no effort into it. And if I tried a little bit, I could get an A. And I had was tired of, as I started to put effort in, realizing no one was going to work harder or care about my own well-being like myself, right? And when my wife was born with our now second kid, our daughter, and she told me that she was going to that she was pregnant again, this like wave of uh, kind of stress and anxiety, like I don't mind putting in 80 hours of work, but I'm not going to do it for someone else's benefit. Just like hit me like a ton of bricks. And literally a week later, I quit my job. Uh, I had nothing in sight. I just was like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And I had a bunch of job offers for way less money than the one I was doing. So I called all the employers up that offered me jobs and said, you willing to pay me part-time if I can create a consulting company, I'll fix all your problems. You don't have to pay me healthcare, you don't have to, none of this stuff. And most of them said, yeah. <laughs> so I kind of took one full-time job and turned it into five or six part-time jobs for a couple of years. And I realized I was still making money for people that treated their staff kind of poorly, even though I was telling them why it works and showing them. And I was like, man, I just, I want more control. 
and I found a way to get back into Jimmy John's. Um, I, the bank was easy. Trying to get the net worth, though, covered for the franchise agreement, I had to call a friend who owned a bunch of real estate to co-sign. But once I got my first two stores, I grew really fast. Went zero to seven in 22 months, taking over markets that were dilapidated, run to the ground. And uh, from there, I've kind of grown out to 11 stores, surviving the pandemic in a restaurant. And I turned that as a way to re- kind of kindle my relationship and uh, with art and writing and editing. That's the short version. <laughs> okay. And carry on. I've been summed up like nine years in like two minutes. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I, I still want to hear more. We have time. But okay. But before that, when you said that reconcile a relationship of art in writing, but when, when you love lighting though? She painted a ton, um, was big into giving us different experiences. We didn't grow up with a lot, but she always made a way to get us to art exhibits or um, like one huge like show a year, like in the, at the theater or go see a musician. So I was experienced or like introduced to that stuff at an early age, right? And um, to understand expressing yourself through different mediums. And then I watched her as she got sick. Um, she had a blood disorder and ended up having cancer and some other stuff, lose her connection with that stuff. And almost felt like she lost a part of her. And I remember after she had passed away, I just kind of felt I wanted to kind of re kind of get back. To that. And that's kind of where it kind of exploded. The uh, original way I got into writing was is kind of a funny story. Most people get into writing because they are inspired. They love an author so much they want to do it. I got into writing because I hated reading. I know it's a weird, weird story, but it's true. So um, I had dislocated my ankle in college, right after college. And I had to keep it elevated for three months. If I put it down even for a minute, like it swelled up. And I got real bored of video games and everything fast. And everything I read, I just didn't like. It just wasn't, it just didn't fit what I was looking for. And my sister was a very avid reader. And, you know, she, everything she tried, I was like, I don't like, I don't like. I was like, I'm going to write a book. She's like, you don't read. How are you going to write a book? I was like, I'm going to write something I would read. And that's how my first two books came about. I actually wrote two, the first drafts of Veritas and Ave Maria in my 20s over three months. And then threw them kind of in a a closet or a drawer for 10 years and then pulled them back out, started editing them again, and then didn't stop writing. I wrote 14 books in a year, just under a million words. And during that process of writing, editing, investigating the publishing world, um, I realized how messed up it was and ended up creating two companies. Wow. I, I can at least say, wow. I started writing because I need to take something out of my brain. Like it's thinking too much. Therefore, I have to put something on the paper. This is oh, totally yeah, to like extract it. <laughs> yeah. yeah like whenever I tell people it. my story and I've been to writing conventions, like everybody looks at me like, you got into writing because you don't like reading? <laughs> I was like, something I don't like it. There's just nothing I enjoy. No, but another thing though, this is something that I learned when I am already grown up. It's actually because I find myself like, like not not kind of like off, but like not as easy to find inspiration or creativity because I'm not reading fiction book as much. And that's why maybe I don't have enough story to write or to share or like having so for me it's the opposite i I tell people sometimes if you read too many stories you're just regurgitating which i've seen with a lot of manuscript submissions that we've worked with with through blue handle is it's they're just kind of rewriting stories they've read right there's no create there's no real originality and it's usually the authors that come to us with like no talent no skill they just have this story they want to tell. And then we have to kind of coach them and teach them how to uh, get to where that end game is. But the stories are usually better. We've had multiple stories who are authors who will they'll see a story that did well. And they're like, I want to rewrite that with my own twist. You're already starting from a place of someone else's story, right? You're not kind of creating. I tell people all the time, if you're stuck writing your creativity, some of it is the pressure you put on yourself. Meaning you don't want to lose it or you don't want to make a mistake. And you have to think of everything in life is about reps, including creativity and writing. So it's more about allowing your brain to just kind of go on a rant. Like if you're at the grocery store and you're thinking of something creatively, don't worry about it. Just enjoy it in the moment. Just let your brain run wild. And if you lose it for later, okay. But don't ever think negatively of those creative moments because then you're going to, when you try to be creative, you're going to have that negative emotion attached to it. It's going to stunt you. If you try to just embrace the moment you're in and be present and enjoy it, and you're going to create these positive things, which is going to make you want to do it more. 
because we all like those dopamine hits. So if you teach your brain that that's a good thing, then when you sit down to be creative, it's a good thing. Yeah, I believe that different person have different trigger to get into the flow state, but it's just the way that how you work best at your flow state time, right? And mm-hmm. this is something that I always got, like you're not reading enough and therefore you cannot write. Like, especially when I work on my master degree or something, like that's why you got your writer stuck, like because you didn't read enough, you know? <laughs> well, I, I like fiction. So I could read history books all day long, like bland, you know, but when it came to creative writing, if I read, you know, this, this is a great story, and I'd be like, oh, okay, like I just, it, it didn't, it never spoke to me to where I like, I would like, it really embraced the story. And then there's, so I'm actually kind of getting into some authors and their writings from like the early 90s. So not like the, whatever's popular now. Um, through audiobooks, I drive a ton. I drive about 30 to 40,000 miles a year checking out all my locations and stuff. And so I've been doing a lot more audiobooks. I'm doing about six to eight books minimum a month right now. So I did 10 one month, but I'll do like five or six at a time. So, because some of them are pretty stale, like uh, Walter Isaacson's book on gene editing or like a book on um, Benjamin Franklin. If you really want to listen about 40 hours of Benjamin Franklin, like I like to be able to listen to a couple chapters and I'll go listen to something else. and and someone's like, well, aren't you bouncing around? I'm like, that's what you do in school, right? Like you do one hour of math, one hour. Of... So that's not uncommon to then. So I almost think people who sit there and read one book straight through, like straight through without changing are freaks. Like, <laughs> like how can you, like, how can you just sit there and not one, you know, want to express different things? Does that make sense? To me, it's like eating nothing but hot dogs for three days and then nothing but salad for three days. Like, like life is about variation and enjoying each channel is a nice way of putting it but in that case i think because you have a very good focus when you're doing one thing though right because well, well when i'm doing it yes but like like i said like doing for me it's more i like to enjoy it for a small chunks right mm. I, it's probably because i do so much stuff i've learned to do things in 10 to 20 minute increments mm-hmm. so it's like focus on my work email for 20 minutes then maybe work on my publishing company for 20 minutes go do two hours training somebody in a location in a store um, doing an hour, like I've learned to kind of break things up into these small chunks for about 10 years now. And, um, it's, it's helped me a ton. So I think that's why I like to switch is because it's kind of how I've taught my, my brain, like hyper focus for 20 minutes on this, then switch to this, because I feel like sometimes we can kind of drift, which is normal, right? You can only focus so long on something. So instead mm-hmm. of getting mad about it, just learn to embrace it and, and, and use the tools that you have. I think that sounds healthier than someone who just like sit down and force themselves to just get it done. That is totally mistaken, in my opinion. Like if you can- right, but writers do that all the time. Not just writers, think about work, right? Okay, I got eight hours, I gotta work. Yeah, but how much work did you get done, right? So maybe if you just, in, instead of getting mad, just embrace it. Okay, if I, I know if I mess around for 20 minutes, I can work hard for 20 minutes instead of timer, right? As opposed to just guessing and hoping. like build the expectation into your schedule and i always tell people when it comes to being successful reprogramming your brain on time is huge you're trained your whole life well at least in this country uh the good old-fashioned every hour right you go to school for 50 minutes then you got 10 minute break right you go to work it's we're working from nine to ten we got a meeting from 10 to like there's these 30 minutes like you're taught to function on the hour which so what happens is because you're on autopilot most days remember my background psychology i like to nerd out on this stuff so you're you're conditioning your brain at 905 to focus on 10 o'clock not 915 not 920 you're literally teaching your brain to look for the next hour which is why a lot of people like i don't know what happened i just lost 15 minutes Mm. if you recondition your brain to think in 10 to 15 minute windows it's not about anxiety like i gotta go it's just being aware it's amazing how much more stuff i teach i own 11 jimmy john's franchises in four cities every market we take over i've got people who go in at 6 a.m and they barely get their opening stuff done by 9 30 10 o'clock when i'm done training them they're doing that same four hours of work in 45 to 50 minutes there's no magic the biggest thing we do is we just change the timer to five minutes it goes off every five minutes and now mentally you're racing five minutes and all of a sudden what you used to wait you used to take an hour on and just kind of all of a sudden you're cranking it out and you're way ahead and now your day's a breeze 
as opposed to like, oh, I've got all day, oh, I've got till this, right? It's that sense of urgency that drastically makes a difference. But until you recondition your head to think of that context, it's almost impossible. Yeah, I agree. Like in my company right now, I don't have like a check-in, check-out time. So they can work whenever they want and the thing's done. You, they can just go and do other things. Or if they can, like, they have no, like, no ideas anymore they can just leave right. and come back later so that's how i train my staff here um yeah i'm not clocking in or out anymore it's too flexible like because that's how i work and i cannot yeah. force them to work the same way as i used to work in other company that's not working for me as well so i agree with you totally when you mentioned that i'm like oh yeah i see that one of the reasons i put our uh, empathy and artistic approach for success, creativity and empathy. The re I always tell people there's a difference between empathy and sympathy. A lot of times people misunderstand that. Sympathy is all oh, uh, poor them. No, empathy is I understand why they are the way they are. I still think they're an a-hole and they got to fix it. I'm not sympathetic, but I am empathetic. It's being able to put yourself in their shoes. And I always tell my leaders, it's about us adapting to the people around us, not hoping they come on our terms. Because if we're waiting for people to show up on our terms all day long, you're going to be waiting a long time. If I'm up front with people all the time, if, if I coach you face to face and that bothers you and you need time to settle it in, tell me. I will only praise you publicly to your face. And then I'll send you a message privately at the end of your day of the things I want you to work on so you have time to take it in. I don't care. I want you to get the feedback. I don't care the format. If I got to send you a carrier pigeon or a balloon message, like whatever, the whole goal is to get you to absorb it, not to do it my way. And I always say we have to almost de brainwash. I actually just, we had a, a kid, we, he was arguing almost like yelling nonstop. And I'm like, let's write this out. This is what you're arguing about. And he's like, yeah. And I go, did we do any of these things you claim we're doing or these things that have happened to other places you've worked and you're carrying over almost that PTSD from poor leadership into what we're doing now? And this is because it's small, you know, it's quick service restaurants. It's a lot of 16 to 22 year olds. The problem is a lot of them get mistreated at, at these, you know, entry level jobs. So when we are just trying to hold them accountable, but also teach them things a lot in the beginning, there's a lot of like snap judgment. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Like we're trying to teach you and hold you accountable to very simple things. This is what it means. Has anyone ever explained it? You know, oh, no, no one ever took the time to explain it. You know, I had a kid who got mad. He's like, my guy doesn't know how to sweep. Man, we're in a Swiffer nation. You know how many people have never <laughs> even owned a broom? So like to think that, you know, a kid who's 16 doesn't know how to sweep. Yeah, no kidding. He might not have ever owned a broom. You know, we had one closing manager get mad because the kid couldn't do dishes properly. And I go, have you asked him if he's ever done dishes? He probably said yes because he was embarrassed. So then I worked with him and was like, do you have a dishwasher at home? Kid's like, no. I was like, do you even have plates at home? He's like, no, we either eat out or paper plates. Uh -huh. And I looked at the manager and I go, that's it. That's your answer. He just throw like, away. <laughs> ask questions. Like, have a, I'm like, let the curiosity in you, like, solve the problem, the empathy, right? Maybe they really don't know. And it's funny to watch you like, how do you not know? There's a lot of reasons why you might not know. Let me list them. <laughs> yeah, and then creativity to be like, okay, let's work through this together. Let's, you know, this is the way I do it. But as long as we get the same end result within this, you know, structure, you can kind of, you know, ma maneuver your own way. And it's, it, it's taken, honestly, my kids in sports has helped me change a lot. I always tell people the leader I am now, is not the leader I started. At. I used mm. to call the walk-in freezer in my office. And I would, I was really good in cold temperatures. It didn't bother me. So I would love watching people squirm in the cold temperatures while I was berating them on why they were, I was an a-hole. Like I was horrible. And uh, it's. Teach, teaching people to be empathetic in the situation like well maybe this person's having a bad day they still need to learn to overcome it but let's show some empathy so they can learn this the red flags along the way that made the mistake in the first place you know but when they meet someone who are patient with them and listen they also have a culture chalk though because they have never right? had anyone who listen yeah. or ask them this type of question before like i never know like what do you mean yeah. what do you, what do you, huh <laughs> Why you ask me that? Like it's something that I I met these type of people and they usually have some boundaries that block them and it's so hard to actually break that down in the beginning though. But later on, they would be more honest and more open to to tell to be able to tell more before we ask even. But I get totally what you mean. But without us curious or asking any question first they would assume that everything is fine like how you ask how are you today i'm fine 
<laughs> One of my favorite phrases is fill the void with information. Don't allow someone's imagination to do it for you. Huh. <laughs> Quote <Quite> that. Because <laughs> you don't know what they are bringing to the party, right? You don't know what is they're stomaching. You don't know what their previous two managers were like. You don't know what their previous job was like. I mean, and people are always afraid to be honest because that's, we haven't created a, an environment in work or with friends to allow it. You know, I'll send a message to, a, you know, buddies of mine from back in college. We still kind of, a few of us keep in touch. I like, hey, man, I hope you have a decent day. Like just that. It's amazing how many people are like, why do you do that? And I'm like, just wishing you a good day. I don't, do I, can I only say, hey, did you watch the game? Like basic communication is such a weird thing for people sometimes. Like what you actually kind of care. Yeah. Like how's you? Like, you know, I had a friend of mine who was going through a divorce and he he's like, I didn't know who to talk to. And then you, I randomly reached out to him one day. And I was like, something doesn't seem right on social media. What are you going through? And he's like, you're the only person that's asked. You know, we had just a, um, a brand ambassador for Book Puma. He was an author I met a couple of years ago in Nashville. I saw her post something about her husband got laid off on Christmas Eve. And I was like, obviously, I can't do the sun, the moon, and the stars. But if I can help you with some extra work, let me know short term. Like, just, she's like, you're the only person who actually reached out felt bad and then tried to offer a solution she's like not even friends and family and it just cracks me up like how l we want people to do that for us but we don't do it in return no matter what it is the smallest things right simple empathy putting yourself in their shoes and then understanding again it's not sympathy but empathy how can we understand what that person's going through and then help it understand maybe how we interact with them. why puma by the way so the story behind the name book puma is kind of funny blue handles easy and short so I'm in the panhandle of Texas now. I grew up in Detroit. Um, I had the, a nickname for years of the color blue. I used to sing Frank Sinatra tunes all the time when I was drunk in college at bars <laughs> I ran. And this karaoke lady gave me the nickname and it stuck for years. I learned real fast that if Charles threw you out of the bar, he was mean. If blue threw you out, they're like, hey, blue is awesome. So that's where blue came from. That's like Blue Rock is one of my companies, Blue Handle. And then Book Puma was this random project one day I did for fun where I I just didn't like the idea of bookworm. I thought it was just like, this, that's like nobody wants to be a bookworm, even though, wait, this is really cool. You read a ton, like you love knowledge, but calling someone a bookworm was such a weird thing. So I went down this weird rabbit hole designing a logo and like a new approach to that branding of bookworm and it became Book Puma. So it had nothing to do with editing at the time. It was just kind of this rabbit hole I went down for fun for like two weeks and uh it sat in a folder and then uh, we were in a meeting for web development and we were redoing our website for the publishing company and he's like that's great that you're selling books but i need something else on the website and we were talking about all these issues we had with people bring you know poor manuscripts i had people turn in manuscripts with like four different fonts in the first 10 pages like i mean like really low like and then they get mad i'm like okay obviously there's a gap between what people know and then what they think is okay. And then I started searching. I was like, it really is no central place that you can feel you trust. And I'm like, well, we can make an editing platform alongside of our, our publishing company. And the guy's like, that's a smart idea. Do you have a name for it? And I was like, actually, I do. And I already have a logo. <laughs> We're just kind of sitting at Santa Drawer for a while. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, but that's the entrepreneurial spirit, right? Like you just kind of go down that rabbit hole and then you're like, I may not be able to use it now, but I can use it later. And that's kind of how that, that happened. Can you explain more about how it's connecting and solve this problem that you discovered? So editing, anybody who's ever written a book or written anything really, um, even in high school, the kind of feedback you get is usually pretty generic, right? It's like, it's red marks. And then it's like, you did this wrong. You need to fix it. And that's mm -hmm. it. Um, when you write a full manuscript, 80 to 100,000 words, and you sit down with, there's all different kinds of editors, developmental editing, like re, let's rework the story, uh, proofreading, you know, oop, this is one misspelled word, line editing, this line, this sentence doesn't make sense. So there's all different levels, but in general, you could spend more than likely anywhere from two to $10,000 in editing. And even though all these people are helping you point these things out, for the most part, they never fix anything. So be like calling a plumber because you have a problem at your house and they tell you what to do. And then they bill you the full amount like they did the work. So editing is kind of this weird thing. So I kind of got frustrated with this approach in general and the fact that it's a very cold space. It's very like, like in high school. Well, this is what my teacher did. Um, I've actually got a Slack conversation with me, my uh, editorial director, and one and his assistant. It's called Charles at uh, Charles Writing School. And I would ask questions like, because I didn't go to school for writing, so I would ask like, and it's usually the the statement is usually, 
is this important or did Miss Anderson in seventh grade just tell you this is the way it is, so that's what you do? Like, is there a real reason behind it? Or are you just, you, you know, is this just something that all these others have agreed upon because, you know, their English teacher beat it into them? There's no real reason. It's just kind of what it is. And oh. honestly, 50 50, half the time, it's just kind of some BS rule that people have agreed is the way to do it. But you don't have to do it that way. Uh -huh. And some things make sense because, you know, I would say you watch CBS Friday night and CIS because you want that formula. And sometimes you're looking for an indie movie. So if you go too far off the rails, your audience gets smaller. So some things make sense. So while going through this, I wanted to lower the bar of entry for writing. Whether you're writing a book, like I said, for your real estate and you just want something out there. You're writing a how-to book for investing. You're writing a story altogether from scratch about two kids that go on a journey to a mythical land that you've created for your kids, or you want to do a children's book or a, whatever it is. The entry point is so expensive for most editors. It cuts off a lot of people. So we created this monthly membership approach. It starts at eight bucks and it works its way up. You can get, you can pay a la carte for one page of feedback. You can do five or 10 pages. You can do a bunch. You, you can uh, pay for a higher amount that gives you so many pages built in. And if you don't use it for a month or two, it just accrues. So now those 10 pages a month is 30 because you haven't used it yet. So instead of like at the end of the year, giving us a check for $3,000 or something, you can lo literally chip away as you write and have a partner next to you. One of the other things we do that's different than most is we do audio notes with our top sheets on our full projects. So when you get a project back saying, here's all your edits, the editor takes time to read it to you and leave you the voice note. And we do that because most of us are self-critical. So you may see the feedback as you have a problem with commas, this is a consistent issue I've seen throughout your book. But the editor is saying, honestly, I see this issue everywhere. You have a problem with commas. Don't be afraid to just make it two sentences. Now, what they say is like, hey, it's no big deal. Everybody does this. Calm down. But you may read it as, well, I'm horrible. I can't. So hearing it in that audio context makes a difference and breaks it down. The whole idea behind Book Puma was to make it accessible, give people the feedback they need, and create an environment of cultivating writers not waiting for them to show up and then telling them how to fix it in the room. Yeah, I agree. Because, you know, like when we read chat or something, when we read in text, we will have a voice of that person in our mind. And we will assume things when how they say. The same as the there's feedback. That, there's that old key, that key and, pe <laughs> and peel skit where it's like, hey, you coming over? Hey, man, yeah. It's like one guy's like really chill about it. The other guy's getting really aggressive. Like, right, you some, the, the written text, if you're in a bad mood, you might take it bad. Where if you're in, right, so being able to hear the tone of somebody, calm and collected, changes the way you take the feedback. Oh, that's so that's so clever. Oh, that's a very. And good we do that. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Slack. We use Slack in our company a lot, and I I teach a lot of my managers to do audio notes, not just typing, because again, it helps with the tone. I could be sending a message out to a bunch of people like, hey man, I keep catching this everywhere. It is getting old. If I type that. They hear the owner saying, man, this is getting old, guys. We got to stop. <laughs> but if I leave an audio note or I, I, a video, it's, hey, guys, this is getting old. This is really easy. It takes 30 seconds to fix. Come on. Right? So it, it drastically changes the, the, the interaction. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think someone also... I think I think the owner not usually use the voice or video as a, the way of medium to send a message because they think about it needs to be transcribed or it needs to be recorded in another way, etc. But this day we have AI, right? So right. yeah, think difference, people. That's a good, that's a good move. I, that's a very and good nowadays move. I just say the people crave human connection, mm. real human connection, because a lot of people don't get it and they don't know how. I spend half my time just teaching people how to communicate. Uh, I had one of my area managers like, I'm tired of the mind games. I'm like, it's not a mind game. It's called management. Like, uh -huh. if you know someone's going to take something the wrong way, you want to build them up and then maybe give them that feedback later. That's not mind games. That's not brainwashing. That's being empathetic of how they're going to respond and trying to maximize the impact of your coaching. I'm like, don't get me wrong. Yeah, I mess with you guys all the time. Like, <laughs> like I will coach you in ways that you are a little confused about. And then like two weeks later, you're like, ah, oh, son of a. But again, you can call it a mind game or you can just call it more like I'm trying to plant seeds so that over time they stick. You know, 
I do a lot of these things where I'll, I'll give people really important coaching in really odd situations. Like we'll be in the middle of a rush and we'll be, um, you know, lying out the door, it's high stress. And I'll be calmly talking to them about something completely unrelated and they may not remember it. But then when we talk about it two weeks later, their subconscious has that information in there. So I'm not bringing it up for the first time. Now I'm bringing it up the second or third time and they're taking it much easier. Yeah. 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 I, I overanalyze a lot of things in my head. It can be exhausting sometimes. <laughs> See, that's why you have to write it out because you have to extract exactly. it out of your brain. <laughs> yeah. I have a question though regarding to editing. Is that difference between um, editing the nonfiction or fiction books versus academically? So yes, I mean the grand scheme of things, the the tone might change, but it's more just as long as both people in the very beginning understand the the expectation of the book. It's mm. you're still writing coherent sentences. You still want a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? Whether it's in your chapter, your paragraph, or your section, or your, right? What's the purpose of this book? What's the story? If you take into account story rules when writing these things, even if it's nonfiction, and you create an arc that keeps the person engaged while they're learning the stuff you're trying to teach them, it's just beneficial long, long term. If you're giving them a cold manual that's simple, like, so you want to get into this, right? Like if it's, then it's going to be hard for them to engage. And unless that's the way you talk, you're almost presenting yourself to your future client. If this is a non, you know, like a nonfiction, that that's how you are. So you almost want to make sure that your book has a personality, has these things, right? Um, we love parables. It's a human nature. So if you're, even if it's nonfiction, writing these like a, a story or an example is huge, but you also want to make sure you follow the right rules when you're doing that, even if it's only a paragraph or two. So that way it keeps the person engaged in the content you're trying to give them, whether it's social media with a hook, a call that, right? A lot of these storytelling rules are they're, they're still kind of the same. Um, and I think a lot of us, especially with AI, it's I laugh because it's not that hard, at least for me and some of my editors anymore, to tell the difference between AI generated content and some now, yes, is it easy, perfect set? No. But you can usually tell because if you I'll give you an example, you can do this today, you'll giggle. Write a paragraph or take a paragraph of something you've already written. Put it in Microsoft Word and turn on all the different like options, then put it in Grammarly, then put it on Google Docs. You will get massive variations on the same paragraph from three different apps. So to think that AI can write something without being confused makes me giggle. Like, because especially English, our language is horrible. It's a mess. So like I could maybe understand maybe something like Japanese, which, you know, essentially is like the Cliff Notes version of Mandarin and Cantonese, where they're like, oh, uh, you have way too many words. We're going to turn this down. You know, and English is like, let's add more. Let's make this more difficult. So like expecting a computer to understand nuance, tenses, you, that's where you see the air is <laughs> like it just it doesn't sometimes it just there's no flow, right? So yeah, you can generate content, but it's not going to be engaging. Yeah, I get what you mean. Because English is not my first language, right? And how many times, oh man, I use Grammarly and I send the work out and grammatical incorrect still. Like, especially I just, when you I put it in post any platform and it's never the same. A lot of Asian based languages are very mathematical in that, right? Like, you know, in Japanese, if you add a ka, it makes it a question, like, versus, so it's, you can, you can streamline the conversation where, English is like, nope, let's add a bunch of words you don't need. Let's give things cut. Like it's oh, like it's it's brutal. Like I that's why I always say, you know, I understand asking for a guide, right? Like, hey, chat GPT, write me three paragraphs on so and so, right? And then maybe rewriting it, going through it, editing, putting your own voice. Again, it doesn't have that. Yes, I guess the basic content creation, right? If you're running generic blog post for a bank sure right like let's be honest you're just kind of creating content that you're hoping somebody reads but again the chances of them engaging in it wholeheartedly compared to the real effort and i know we all look for shortcuts but have you ever seen the movie idiocracy no no oh, i highly suggest you look it up so uh luke wilson say the name again being idiocracy like idiot democracy okay. smushed together so Luke Wilson, Owen Wilson's brother, like it's fro it's a horribly comedic, stupid movie, but it's kind of funny. So he gets frozen in time, comes in the future, and like everybody's an idiot. And it's because like they keep taking the short way out because he just has basic human common sense that hasn't been like washed out through technology. Everyone thinks he's kind of a genius. Like 
you know, they're killing the world's crops because they're giving it like the equivalent of Gatorade. Like, but it's got electrolytes. I'm like, okay, but you're putting salt and you're like killing it. But because people have lost the ability to think through. And that's why I think about engaging. Yes, you can, you kind of still need a human touch. Yes, there's, there's always going to be embracing of tools, right? Like, you know, if you can use a nail gun or an electric screwdriver versus hand cranking, well, no kidding. Right. Mm-hmm. But there still needs to be someone who has the vision or who can understand. Yes, it looks flat, but I know from experience this area, you know, the ground's going to settle over time. Like those things, those variables are really hard to learn to, to manufacture. Right. You know, and you listen to some of these, even the people who create this stuff, they're like, honestly, man, like AI is still really dumb, which it is. But like we get, and if you go back, I forgot what I was, where I was reading this, they were talking about, um, Every two years is a new tech, like amazing thing, right? There was virtual reality. Now it's AI before the, and it's this huge push for like a year kind of for fundraising, right? And then you see it kind of tail off and you don't get what they promise. <laughs> what is the next S curve? Tell me. Right. And at the end of the day, it still comes back to the people that succeed are the ones that, the long-term ones are the ones that find the niche, that find the human element, that find a way, you know what I mean? That find a way to keep it going. I still yeah. believe this day that we have to master our own craft. Like, I wouldn't be able to sleep if I don't feel like this is exactly my life work. That that is Beautifully what I said. have come up. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that is what I have come up at the end of the day of every day. That the more I find to find any shortcuts or any way to solve small problems and just like go through. It's not really satisfying me anymore, but the more I develop myself through the change, through the challenge, to any obstacle, but I get better at what I do the best. That's actually how I develop my craft, my own craft, to be a better person. And I can sleep. Need better. outside. And we all need outside friction, even though we hate it. We need it. You know, you need an enemy. You need an arch nemesis. You need something that's pushing you, that's driving you. I did my most growth when I was at a decent amount of self-esteem mixed with an a hole of a boss, and I started to push back because I had that friction. I was like, no, no, and I wanted to do better and do better. And if you take that away, and there is no friction, it's really hard to be self-motivated. Not saying you can't do it, but and it makes a difference. Yeah. And I always say, don't belittle your success or your goal. I say this all the time, whether it's writing or just life. You know, there's all these gurus out there like, I made a billion dollars. You can too. If you're living on the street, going from the street to an apartment is a gigantic success. And because you're not making a billion dollars, it's stupid to belittle yourself or your goal for just getting off the street. Or now that you're off the street, you just want to make a little bit more money and set your kids up with a better school. Those are amazing goals. Those are amazing successes. So it's like for every like gigantic outlier, we sometimes forget to be thankful and appreciative to the successes we've pulled off. Whenever I get whiny, I get stressed. I actually just got brutally stressed. I'm building the 11 store right now. It's costing a ton of money. I spent way too much money in one day. It like it drove me nuts for like three days. And I always I say this phrase out loud to a lot of people. My 20 year old self would kick my butt for complaining. <laughs> Like you wanted this. This is what you had. This is more than you ever imagined. Like figure it out. You've gotten this far, right? And I just try to remind myself of that situation. Like I, I survived my worst day every time because I'm still here. And I've usually done my best work when things were at their worst. And that's where I'm building. That's the biggest thing I feel. That's where my most of my success came from. I finally had the realization that the world is built by idiots that just had the dream. That they could pull it off, like the speech by Steve Jobs at Stanford, right? You know, where he's like, "You, when you realize that everyone else is the same as you, you can make an impact, right?" Uh, my grandmother used to say, "I remember I had the realization in college, I'm like, oh, my parents are the same idiots I went to high school with." She's like, "Yes, there's no difference. You know, like you put people up on pedestals, but when you real, it's okay, right? To be like, wow, they're doing great, but when you realize there isn't a huge difference between, you know." Person A and person B, grand. Okay, yeah, I'll never beat Usain Bolt in the race. Like I don't have the genetics for it. Like some things are plausible to be like, okay, that's different. But if you put in the work, you can improve and get better at pretty much anything. So if you start changing the way you gauge or changing the way you think of creativity or work, it's it's easier to survive the, the negativity. I always say, think of how much work it took you to go from a baby who couldn't feed themselves 
wipe themselves, or walk. Think of how many times you fell, crapped your pants, were hungry because you couldn't feed yourself. For years. That's years. And now, if we try for like a week, we're like, it's too hard. <laughs> like, like, man, 300% of your life, the first three years, all you did was fail 100 times a day. Like, you didn't succeed at anything. And we, 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 I think we sometimes forget that with the failures needed to keep pushing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I'm listening to every single word that you say. So I can so, get on my soapbox really quickly. <laughs> no, it's great. I'm I'm enjoy listening to you. No, but I want to know yeah. who would be a good fit or who exactly would be good fit to to join a membership of Puma Book Club. I said because the bar is so low, if you if you want to improve your writing for um, work, maybe you're a content creator, maybe you are trying to write better blogs, right? Um, maybe you do have a creative project, anything. That's the beauty of what we're doing at Book Puma is if you're writing 100 pages a week or one page a week, there's a plan for you. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to build confidence in your writing if you're waiting till the end. So if you're if you're waiting till you've written eighty thousand words to get feedback, you're gonna be you're, which everybody takes way too personal, myself included. I always say I got so upset I created two companies. <laughs> um, if you start earlier in the process, then you're gonna have less mistakes along the way. That's gonna build your confidence, improve your writing, improve your output. And puts you in a better mood as you're writing. Uh, some of my favorite um, responses I see on social media, we we have a couple of authors recently where he's like, I told my wife, this seems fake. First, they did two pages for free to edit. Then the entry point was so low. And then I'm getting feedback. And I'm like, he's like, I remember looking at my wife going, this is real. This isn't a joke. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> like, I was like, right. And at that, so I always say, honestly, anybody, uh, there's a crazy stat, something like in the U.S., over 80% of adult Americans believe they have a story inside them to write in some form or another. Take the time, whether it's a short story, whether it's a full story, whether it's poetry. We've worked with uh, script writers. We've worked with poets. We've worked, I'm working with a musician right now out of Nashville who's trying to figure out if he wants to stick to poetry or if he wants to create it to more stories. But the creative writing process is pretty similar no matter the genre. And getting good, healthy feedback is amazing for anyone's inspirational or creative journey. Yeah, it already sounds amazing. But where can they find you? Where can they find Book Puma editing them? So Book Puma Edit is the website uh, to sign up. You can schedule calls. You can submit uh, free edits. Uh, Blue Handle Publishing, if you're looking for publishing services and you want to submit a manuscript. Uh, social media, I'm pretty simple. I'm the same on every platform, including LinkedIn. It's Charles, the number three, hats, C-H-A-R-L-E-S, three, H-A-T-S, Charles, three hats. Uh, the name came from the general you idea that, you know, company. not just that, <laughs> I, I wear many hats in a given day, you know, businessman, <laughs> personal, family, friend, right? Um and it's just kind of a simple way to kind of get my message out there that, you know, and the, the algorithm hates me because I don't hit one niche. It's funny. You know, I get people who are like, man, your content's awesome. How come? And I'm like, because I'm not sitting there making like the same singular focused like thing all the time. So I just let our, our good, our awesome people at Book Puma, our social marketing and, you know, and Blue Handle bring the majority of the people in. And then when they people find me, you know, we do writing consulting. So where it's not really editing, but it's more like, one-on-one -on -one calls, uh, like a 30-minute call every week or every other week. Um, we just helped an author. We actually ended up signing through the process. Uh, his name is Will. He He's like, honestly, he's like, I wanted to write better. I always joke, I wanted to write gooder um, <laughs> for my call and improve because I knew they were building me up. Like a really good teacher, right? Like you end up doing better in school because that teacher finds a way to inspire you as opposed to not really having somebody to hold you accountable. So having that accountability plus having someone to share your joy with who can be like, that's awesome, but that's in your head. That's not on the page. You know, mm. it's, it's really, you know, that's one of my favorites. I, I, I use that, not just that in writing, but at work all the time, which is, you may have thought that, but that's not what you communicate. Mm. Like the message up here is not the same as the message you put out in the world. And mm -hmm. it's uh, I think whether we're writing or whether we're um, working or talking or communicating, I think sometimes we forget that, right? And we take everything personal. It's, I, you know, people get mad at me because I take almost nothing personal. Um, I think it's just, I interact with so many people in a given day, I'd be really upset 24 <laughs> seven. Um, and I've just learned to, again, empathy. If this person's that mad at me, why are they mad at me? 
is it something I did? Is it something that happened to them and it has nothing to do with running it, right? Um, and then I just either go, well, can, is it something I can even solve? Or do I just have to let it settle and then I can deal with it later? That just comes from experience. You know, it's, you know, you just exhaust at the end of the week because you're trying to fix everything. And then you're like, I can't do this anymore. Mm, so. Right. Yeah. So do you like writing like, to get it out? Are you talking about journaling or so? Again, I would say something. Yeah. I was thinking. Us, but I like when you're talking about writing. So um, I always like to try to finish. I do a podcast, talk more about the person who was gracious enough to bring me on. So when you write, are you journaling? Are you writing like notes from the day? Is it more like a task list? A little bit of everything? A little bit of everything. So here's the thing. I have been uh, in my bucket list to write a book of the one that I trademark on my method for a really long time. But I was stuck at where everything is still in my head and everything is everywhere because I write too many notes. So I am start using um, Obsidian. Do you know Obsidian? I've heard about it, yes. So it's I just wanted, because in my brain, there's too many information and we do management consulting. So that's why I'm like information overload somehow. I don't, I didn't feel overload though, but there are many information in my brain. So I just think that Obsidian will help me to connect everything with backlinks and all the keywords so that when I am ready to write the book, it would help me. That's that's the key. But the goal is actually I'm trying to write a, a blog every day. This year, I'm actually trying to do that, but I haven't started yet. And it's already a month apart. <laughs> so that's kind of hard to do so i think what would maybe help you is if you try to write um seven short blog posts once a week that will go out for the week because once you start the creative process it's easier to keep it going or even build into your schedule okay i'm gonna write one short blog post before i start my day on monday then i'm gonna short another write another one and, the, and do it over two days but literally build in when you're gonna do it because then what ends up happening is while you're doing consulting while you're looking at different emails while you're looking at different clients different things are going to come up and when you know, yeah. okay, from 2 to 2.30, I'm going to write, what will happen is the big pressing thing you maybe worked on that day will naturally come out in that time frame. So you kind of have to build it in. And then what I always suggest most people, if you're trying to do blogs, is write 20 to 30 of them and bank them before you start this process. Because there's always going to be days there. And then you can pull, hey, I already got one, sweet. you know. And honestly, what a lot of content creators will tell me, even newsletters, blogs, whatever, it takes seven to eight times for most of us to even act on something. Don't be afraid, afraid to just repost old stuff. Same with the blog. If, it, if you haven't posted since last month, maybe tweak it a little bit, maybe change the title, change the intro, but just reuse the same thing. It's okay. Not everything has to be the most creative brand new, you know what I mean? Like, Because most of us won't even act on it anyways until we've seen it seven or eight times. What about the first book? I also got that issue that still limits me to start don't writing. Write, don't write linear. linear. So some of the best authors you've ever met don't write beginning to end. They just, they'll be like, I have an idea. And they'll write maybe like a, what's called a log line or a paragraph, like a short synopsis of what they want their story to be about. And then they'll write, they'll think of, okay, where would I like it to take place? So uh, a couple of scenes here and there. And then they'll just write the scene, even if it's a couple paragraphs or a, a paragraph. And then randomly when they're like, you know, I'm in the mood to write, they'll look at their different kind of like areas and go, I feel like writing that today. Then at the end of like a month, you have all these different scenes and you can sit there and go, okay, I like this one. I like this one. I like that one. How do I connect them? And then your brain naturally will be like, okay, if I start at A, how do I get to B? It's easier to fill that creative gap to be like, I have A and B. How do I get there? Like if you wake up in the morning and go, I'm going to write a story about a cross-country journey. From where to where? Are you going to stop anywhere? That's kind of hard. If you say, I'm going from D.C. to Amarillo, where I live, to see my friend Charles, you can start there. And then you can go, well, where? then your brain might go, but where would I stop in the middle? That's a pretty long drive. Ooh, I'm going to stop in Oklahoma City. Ooh, I might stop in Arkansas. Then you write something in Arkansas. Okay, but how... What happened in Arkansas, then you can start to piece it together in smaller chunks than trying to do this huge, you know, daunting task. Mm, it's like how you do puzzle that you don't know how to complete a picture. Even how you get dressed. You don't wake up in the morning and be like, oh, you know, like, <laughs> it's, yeah. okay, what pants are we today? What shirt are we on? And you just start piece. And then when you have two decisions, it's easier to make, okay, now they have two, what belt? Now they have this, what sock? So it's a lot of times, again, we don't give ourselves permission to start small. We're always shooting big. Don't be afraid to start small. And you have to start something even. That is the point. 
<laughs> I was so, don't over don't overthink it. I mean, yeah, Ave Maria, which is my favorite story I ever wrote, but it's the worst story I've ever written. It's the second book in my series. Is um, I mean, all authors are critical. It is what it is. But my third book is the best I think I've written out there and produced pretty good. The one that's out that just released in November. But I took the book from like one hundred twenty thousand words to eighty. Like I cut a lot of it. So like. And that's not uncommon. So don't be afraid to just work through it and then later go, oh, that's horrible. I like that. And then just kind of progress. But that's kind of the beauty of Book Puma. Instead of this daunting task of this gigantic, I need to write everything, you can start small, reach out small, and then get the confirmation you need on where you're headed. So everyone, if you're not convinced yet, I'm even convinced as well. So <laughs> please check the link. It will be around here, www.bookpumaedit.com. And yep. Also, it will be in the description as well as the show notes. So thank you, Charles, so much for sharing these awesome tips. And also, I think we have get unstuck in many areas of like the way we think, the way we see other people and how we write and communicate between humans even. So thank you so much for joining Get Unstuck podcast today, Charles. You have a blessed day. I hope this episode inspires you wherever you are in your entrepreneurial journey so that you can have your business that supports your lifestyle. Get a show note at getunstuckmethod.com slash podcast. Review what we have learned together today and start implementing right now. See it by yourself. The result of your consistent action are worth it. You deserve the freedom to enjoy your life. Until the next episode, let's get unstuck.